What is up? In this video, we're going to be looking at Redshift for Cinema 4D with Cine Designer. We're going to be doing a quick overview of the different features, what's a little bit different, and how to get around so you can get started. And then in future videos, we're going to get into more of the specifics and some of the nitty gritty technical details. So here we are in Cinema 4D and this lovely kitchen here, this is provided by a really great site called Pixel Lab. This is a free model you can download. It's unfortunately not going to be textured for Redshift. I had to do that manually, which I could possibly show in the future, but you can go get the model anyway, and if you're inclined, you can start to retexture it. But this is where I got it, and they have a lot of really cool products as well. Maybe I'll make a video about some of their stuff uh, in the future. But here we are. I've used their kitchen model. It looks really nice. Uh, I really need to start building out uh, more exteriors, but we're going to be using this for our demo. So before we get into the actual details of how to use Redshift, I want to give a quick demo here. So I'm going to hit play. And this is a, a somewhat new concept, right, up here. So this is now essentially loading this entire scene into our GPUs, right? So I have two NVIDIA 1080 Ti's. And so this whole scene is getting put on the renderer, onto the GPUs. And what that allows us to do is have a very fast update, right? It's almost almost a real-time update in a way. So I'm, I'm moving the viewport around. And you can see that the textures actually don't look great in the viewport. These aren't too bad, but sometimes they look really bad. But over here, it's basically photo accurate, which is really nice. So here is 3D Scan Matt Workman, which I'll be making a video about uh, very soon once they uh, get their site up. But here we are. This is GPU rendering. And there's another GPU renderer that's very popular in the industry. It's called Octane. I don't personally believe Octane is the right engine for our industry, but it is really nice. And I am going to eventually support it. But as you can see, we're, we're almost like doing photography, right? Because you're looking at this and it's moving so quickly that you almost forget that it's 3D. That's, that's the idea with GPU rendering is that things move so fast and update so quickly that you can make changes and start to really work like you're working uh, with a real photo camera and lights. So I'll change some of the stuff here really quickly. So what we have outside is a frame. I'll show you it's over here. You can kind of tip, tip up. This is a emitting light, which you can see. Uh, otherwise, it's black, and there's a building outside, one of the scans. And what I'll do here is I will show you how fast it is to kind of work through some of the lighting. So I guess I'll pick a uh, shot like this is not the best, but not the worst. So here, I'll show you. So what we have here is our 6 by frame, and this is a frame light. We're going to have diffusion ones very soon, but this is a frame light. So this thing is just going to emit light regardless of if there's light behind it. And I'll show you that if I turn it off, it updates in the viewport pretty quickly. So I can kind of scoot around the scene. I'm like, okay, this is what it looks like when it's when it's moody. I can slide in here. I'm on a pretty wide lens, but you can get a you get a feel very quickly for how this scene feels. And you can change things very quickly. So I'm gonna change put the light back on. This is a this is a Cine Designer Redshift light, of course. And then I can change the value to like one or something like that. So we're gonna bring down its intensity quite a bit. Does that actually work? Oops. Um, where is it here? Let's see. Did that actually do anything? Was that, was that correct? Uh, I'll change the color to like blue, something like this. And now it's putting out blue light and I'll put the intensity back to like four. And you just see how fast this whole process really is. It's kind of cool. It's a very wide lens. I think I have an actual camera in here. I do. Okay. So let's go to the actual camera. And now I can basically work kind of in real time here. So I'm like, okay, well, obviously that doesn't look very nice. Let's give it kind of a warm look. So I'm going to change this here. And there it is, instantly pretty much updated really quick. And so if I turn the light off outside, I can make it very dark in here. Going to get kind of a nighttime vibe. And we have our, our practical lights are on. And this is how quick this stuff happens. This is all real time. And so I guess what I'll do here now is I'll hit pause. And without going over the render settings here, because we'll cover those in just a bit, this is going to be kind of a long video. Uh, I'm going to turn that up just a bit. This is not ideal, but this will get it done. I'm going to do a, a 12, a 1920 by 1080 frame for you right here. And let's see how fast this goes. We're going to make sure to render out of this camera. And I'm going to hit Shift R. And let's watch this frame render. Now, if you were using physical render, this would take a hot minute. I, I would expect a frame like this to resolve nicely using QMC, even on a Threadripper, which is what I have for a CPU. I would think this might take somewhere like a half an hour, maybe an hour, honestly, half an hour to an hour to make a 1080 frame that is photorealistic and has nice settings for the lighting GI and all that. But you'll see here with Redshift that this should probably only take, I don't know, like 
two minutes, something like that. Uh, I'm not going to fast forward the renderer because uh, this is just going to be a long video, so just buckle in. Uh, it's going through, and I have two GPUs, so you see two squares, hopefully, uh, going through. And you'll see that we have the two GPUs loaded here, and it tells you how much is free uh, memory-wise. I think I have 11 gigs on both. And it's loading the geometry and the textures into the GPUs, and that's basically what allows it to render so quickly. So here we are. I think this frame is going to probably render in about like a minute 30, and that is incredibly fast. And also very little grain, a very clean render, and we're getting uh, really nice cinematic results uh, out of the gate. Depth of field, motion blur, all those things really do not affect the speed all that much of Redshift. So all the things that used to take a long time to render now take way, way less time with Redshift. So that allows you to iterate faster in the render view, and that allows you to make your final renders like this, like if this is your final diagram. And as well, you can work with much bigger assets like scans and whatnot. Using scans in physical renderer, that's a little bit, it's a little bit tough on the computer, but using it in Redshift, as long as it fits in your GPU, it's actually really, really fast, and you can just throw a ton at it. So that is the quick demo. So let's kind of start this from scratch now. So I am going to start a new scene here. We're going to go to new, and I'm going to go to my uh, startup layout. So what you're going to need first is to install Redshift, and then you'll get this. And I have the very latest version as of recording this. They update very quickly. And uh, what you'll want to then do is go to, I'll go to the website. Um, you're going to want to go to cinematographydb.com. And when you go, well, I have this now. I'm starting to put all the Redshift stuff separately. So all this stuff is just for Redshift. So you download these and you install them into the content browser. But um, unfortunately, I also have these where I put them together. And I think that was confusing to people. So for the majority of them, they are like this. So you have to go download this one, for instance. And there's going to be a version that says Area Sky Panel. And there's going to be a version that says RS. Aria Sky Panel, and you want the RS one for Redshift. I'm going to separate them, and I'm also going to make libraries so that you don't have to individually download them. It's just all very much in flux at this point. So go get some Redshift stuff. I'd start by getting a camera, some lights. And uh, to get this set up on your computer, I you see I had a very specific layout. What you're going to want is the Redshift Render View. And this is the magical one, the Render View. So not the IPR, but the Render View. And what I do is I take this, I grab these little grids here, and I put it right there something like this and then you're going to be able to use this as your kind of viewfinder and preview monitor and then what i usually do is i take this thing and i put it about there because my scenes get kind of big and i want like a big list and then i don't really use takes so i can close that content browser i don't like it there and structure i don't i don't really need that uh, at the moment so this is the layout that i use and then you can go to window um, save layout as. You save it, you name it, and then it's up here. So I have mine already. And I think I call it this. I have one for my dual monitors, but I won't show that in this one. So we'll just work with this one for now. So it's all very much the same workflow. It's just a little bit different. So let's look at some of the stuff here. Let's go to our content browser. And you'll see I have uh, physical stuff up here and Redshift stuff down here. So let's bring in a... Oh, this got all funny. Well, anyway, let's bring in a character. That's me. And I am actually going to make myself available to download in the near future, <laughs> just not yet. But I've been using myself as a demo lately. It's kind of funny. This person has, well, let's, let's bring it up here. This is a good start. So in here is the geometry of the model. And this is the skeleton. And we'll cover how to make them dance and move around and stuff like that. It's pretty, it's really easy, actually. I just haven't done a tutorial on it. Uh, the geometry here has a texture like you'd expect up there, except it is a redshift texture. So... For redshift textures, you can't just double-click them, right? So if you if you double-click them, there's really not much in here. I mean, I guess you can start to dig through this, but that's not the way you want to do it. So what you want to do is you click the texture, and then you're going to go over here, and it's going to say Edit Shader Graph. So this is new. And it's okay to feel overwhelmed by this, this new thing. This is much different than we're, we're used to working, especially if you don't come from Resolve or anything that's node-based. But let me break down how this works. So... We basically have the texture, which is the color map that has me all kind of like unwrapped and terrifying. We put that into this RS material. And that's basically saying that we want this color to be on this material. And then we also have a normal map that's going to go into the bump. And this is actually the old way of doing it. So 
I will make a new material so that this makes a little bit more sense. So let's make a floor here, okay? And let's just let's just get this scene going. I'm going to hit play. And what we have now is the default lighting from Cinema 4D, which is fine. It's like a flat light. But you can see how fast this is now, so much that, uh, yeah, kind of changes the game that you can just leave this on the whole time. So we're just going to attempt to leave this on, and hopefully it doesn't uh, crash. You know, I'm doing screen recording, and if you start to throw too much at it, it can get a little bit unstable. But overall, Redshift, very stable compared to, say, uh, Octane in my experience. So what we're going to create now is called a dome light. And this is the equivalent of making a sky in physical renderer and making it white. So this is just going to put out really soft flat light from basically all directions, even, even from below. So that's what we're going to use for lighting. And again, extremely fast. And if I was to just pause this and render, oh, wow. OK, well, first of all, you need to uh, go to render settings and switch this to actually be Redshift. Um, but then using just the stock render settings, You'll see how fast that rendered. It rendered in one second. So we're working with really, really crazy render times now. It's, it's awesome. This is how I make my animations so fast. With, three, with one second to three second renders, you can make animations pretty easily. So let's go to Create. And this is how we make materials. Redshift. Materials. Don't worry about all this stuff. You don't really need any of it except for Material. That's it. You can also go up to Redshift, Materials, Material. That's the only one you're going to need for like so much of this. So. We're going to drag this onto there, and then I'll hit play again. And now you'll see that, that isn't the, it's no longer the default um, Cinema 4D Blue. It's actually the default Redshift shader. And it's, kinda, it's got a nice little reflection in it, right? So let's look at these materials here. So we're going to open this up. And this is where two monitors is pretty helpful. But just keep an eye on what's going on over here. You know, I'm going to make this a little bit bigger so it's uh, a little bit easier. Because we don't really, you start to rely on, on, on that monitor a lot less. And you need, uh, you want to look at the render view, really nice. So I'm going to make this one nice and big for us here. Hopefully this doesn't crush my system. Um, so let's look at what's going on here. So we have the RS material node here. And that's where all the settings are. This is the main thing. This output, you really don't have to worry about it at this point. We'll get into more advanced stuff. But uh, we're going to make this a little bit bigger, like that. It's just like, just like Resolve, no big deal. But if you click on this, now you get all the settings you're used to. That's all that's really happening here. And so let's turn off these, and I'll just start unfolding them one by one. So we have basic and base properties. Base properties is where you're going to spend like 99% of your time here. So we have the first one is diffuse, and that's the that's the color basically. So right now it's set to gray, but we could set it to like um, like orange. And it should update. There it goes. It updates, and it's orange with a reflection over it. So that's the that's the first thing you can do. And then we go to reflection here. And you can change the color of the reflection. So let's just leave it at white for now. And you can also go to the roughness, which is the big part. And it's going to be uh, 0 to 1, I believe. Yeah. So if you're 0, it's like a perfect mirror. And if you go to 1, it's diffuse. There's basically no reflection. But then anywhere in between, you basically get glossiness, right? You get kind of uh, blurrier reflections. And look how fast it is to check where you want it. This is the beauty of Redshift and GPU rendering, is that you're interactively very quickly being able to change very subtle um, parameters here. So doing this in, in physical render, you'd have to change the setting, hit render, wait a few seconds at, or minutes sometimes. Uh, here, you just do it right here. So say we want to do something like that. That's kind of a nice blurry reflection, kind of cool. Um, there's a lot of other settings here, but the one that's probably most important is this IOR. And for something like this, I would say 1.35 is good. Um, I would basically say for you, keep things at 1.35. 1 1.5 isn't going to break anything, but you know that's that's a good place to be. So let's uh, close this, and I'll just kind of float around a little bit, and I'll show you how how fast and interactive this whole thing is. Now we have a very simple scene, but you can understand how how kind of fun this is. You have this like little viewport into the world, and it's photorealistic right out of the gate. So what I'm going to do now is set up another material. Uh, I guess I'll just use this same one. I'll open it up. And I'll show you how to set up materials in this just like we would in physical. I think that was the last tutorial I made. So here it's a little bit different. So you need to go up here, and you're going to go into textures. And then you're going to grab this texture here and pull it in. Or you can write up here, 
texture and it it searches it for you. I think you can right click too, but those are the those are the good ways. So what you're going to do now is this is a file node, right? Basically, and what you're going to do is you're going to go to its general and its path and you just want to go find your file. So I'm going to go get find mine. Okay, so here I am in my asphalt 2 uh, folder here, we use the same texture to do the um, do the materials for physical render, and now we're going to do it in Redshift. So we want our diffuse or our color, and that's what we've loaded here. I'm actually going to pause the renderer. Uh, Redshift is so fast that sometimes I forget to turn it off, and it's just always in the background on. But uh, you know, you want to turn it off if you're not using it. Now the weird thing here is you need to grab this, put it into this little blue circle or square here, and then you need to go into Base Properties, Diffuse Color, and now oop, okay, and I guess it auto Auto shrunk it together, shrunk it. But uh, now we have, if we look at it, now that is on there. So I guess I'll hit play again so you can see it. And now we have the base color in there. And just like in uh, physical render, I want to click on this, and I want to change it from UV mapping to cubic, just so that the scale is how I want it to be. Just a little bit smaller, basically. So let's continue, and I'll try to leave this on, and hopefully it doesn't break anything. So, um. What you can see now is that we have our color map and we have our reflection. So again, if I go like this, it's like a perfect mirror. Like look at my reflection down there. It's basically glass. Like it's like a perfect reflection. And I can start to introduce um, different amounts of blurriness until the point where it goes away almost. So something around here kind of changes the wetness of it, right? And it's I think something like this is always good, like a blurry but but still there. And if you want to be more overt with it, like it's wet, like there's water on it, you do something like this. But a little bit of blurriness or roughness is always good. And then uh, this changes how bright that reflection is to the point where like that's gone, very subtle, and you bring it back. And I'll, I'll talk about this in future videos, like what's realistic as far as like these ratios. But for now, you can just play with these. Whatever looks good to you, that's what looks good. But in the case we don't want all of it to be the same uh, roughness, we will use another map. So. In this case, we're going to write texture up here. Oops, but spell it right. And we're going to go in here, and we're going to go find our normal map. I'm going to pause the renderer. And this one we're going to use for the normal map. So we're going to go grab our normal map here. And you can't just pipe it straight in. It has to go through one node. I believe this is the workflow. It changed recently because <laughs> Redshift changes all the time. That's a good thing. They're making it better. You're going to need to take the, the normal map, put it into an RS displacement, and put it into the texture map. And then this goes back in here. You go to overall and bump. You just got to start memorizing these things. Oh, okay. So it kind of like automatically does that. So only thing we have to do now is you need to go to the displacement node. You need to change it from height field to vector. And you need to change it from object to tangent, I believe. Basically, vector tangent, that's what a normal map is. You just have to change it. And there's something about the linear color space. I forget. I forget what it is, but uh, this will still get you. This will still get you there. So let's hit play. And let's see if that did anything <laughs> noticeable to the map. So let's let's slide in here. Let's slide in there to the floor. And floors for me are like everything. That's like where like you start to really notice. Oh, I put it into emission color, so that's a fail. Let's undo that. <laughs> <laughs> let's put it into actual bump and uh, let's see if there's much of a difference here uh, let's see did that load I feel like I don't see that I don't really see it like working um, let me see here so overall bump this is a displacement what if I change this to object nah I'm pretty sure this is supposed to be like this vector that bump doesn't seem like all that doesn't seem like it did very much. Oh no, I guess it. I guess it's in there. Well, I'll show you the old way as well while we're here. Uh, I'm still learning this. This is why I've I've been holding off. But you can't see it's legacy now. They don't really want you to do this. But you can also bring in an RS normal map, go get the normal map, and then pump this or pipe this rather into the bump. See that did it. That actually did it the way that I was expecting it to. Now there's actually bump. So I'm doing this wrong. Oh god, I should I should have waited on the tutorial, but uh, I'm not sure why this is different. It's vector and then tangent. Um, but I will come back and I'll do this again later. This is still just the demo. So for now, we'll use the legacy version. This is how you get the bump map in there. And the next thing we're going to add is a roughness map. So we're going to bring in another texture. And what we're going to do is we're going to go get our roughness, our glossiness rather. And we're going to load this into the reflection roughness. 
okay? So now, instead of it all being the same roughness, if you look at the reflection, I think we can tell here, if you look at it, some of it's glossy, as in rough, and some of it's very smooth, like a mirror, right? So it's, it's broken up, and it's all based on the color. And we did the same thing in Physical Renderer, but uh, you get a much quicker preview of what it's going to look like here uh, using Redshift because it just renders so quickly. So we have, uh, we have the color, we have different roughnesses at different parts, and we have a normal map for the bumping, and I had to use the old school one. I guess I don't understand the new one yet. I'll just go, I'm just going to go watch some more tutorials on it. Uh, and the last thing I want to show you here, this is going to be a super long video, so apologize about that, is we're going to take a ramp. And this is the same thing as a colorizer in Cinema 4D. Uh, so just follow along here. We're going to change this ramp from UV to Alt. And I think that's it. So now we're going to take our roughness map, put it into here, input. And then we're going to take the out and put that here instead. So not much is going to change at first. So let's zoom in on the old feet, feet and floor. And then we can tweak this now. So right now, I think what this is, is that the lower part of the, of the mesh is reflective and the top part is rough. So if we hit invert, it flips. Oh, no, this looks like it's like that. I don't know. It flips it. It makes the top basically shiny and the bottom rough, and then you flip it back and forth. So whichever one looks better for you, there's really no correct one. But then what we can do is we can also affect um, how, how reflective this is and how wet it is. So we can add a middle point. So I double-clicked there. Oh, no, undo that. And we can change by going like this how reflective it is. So if I go like this, I believe I'm making it pretty dry looking, right? So this is like dry pavement, dry concrete or asphalt, rather. So that, that looks nice, to be honest, because concrete, I mean, asphalt, rather, if it's not wet, it's not that reflective. So that actually feels pretty realistic. But say you want it to be like it just rained and you, you wanted to have it like a lot of reflection on it. Now it's really glossy, right? So now you have this nice wet looking pavement. And you basically play in between here. And because it's so fast at updating, you can really figure out where you want it to be as far as, um, oops, as far as how wet and reflective it looks. So like if you want like a real sexy night exterior, you're going to want something like this because it'll reflect everything. So let's leave it like uber reflective. And that is how we set up materials. There's a whole lot more, but th that's what's relevant to, to almost most of the scenes you're going to be doing. You want to set up something like this. So we're doing pretty well here. Let's pause this. And then let's look at the cameras. So I'm going to build a quick scene here using some scans that I have. Um, let's grab this. And let's grab this. Right. So these are both scans that are available on Set Designer. They should come pretty much pre-textured. Oops. Pretty much pre-textured for Redshift already. You don't have to change anything. They should just come in normally. Put this down here. And uh, I guess I'll put it a little bit farther back. I'm just trying to create some depth here so you can see. And then with this, because we are cubic map, you can just go like this. And this is kind of the same video that we did for the uh, working with scans, but now it's specifically just for Redshift. So I'll put this like that and this here. Right? And now you have a very ugly scene. Uh, so let's go into here. Let's grab an Alexa, a gearhead, and the, the Cobra. Doesn't really matter. Um, oh, I need to go back to... I'm in startup. I'm going to go back to my actual... Uh, layout look because I need this. I need that rig. So let's put this all in here. And we have our camera. So uh, now what we can do, if we open this up, you'll see that this these are now red because they're redshift versions, the icons. And this is the same except it has a tag on it, this thing. And you guys won't see this. I'll turn them off so it looks a little bit more similar. Um, yeah, so it should look like this for you. So let's actually go and look through the camera here, and then we're going to hit play. And this is an important thing to understand as well. So right now we're looking through the actual camera, and what you want to do is you want to click lock. And that little lock is going to make sure that you stay in this camera, even if now I go to the behind the scenes view. You're still looking through this camera. So now I can move this forward. And you can just look through here like it's the viewfinder or mo external monitor model. Oh, I'm sorry, external monitor of the camera. So we're gonna get up in here, and this all works the same as it does in uh, regular Cine Designer Physical. 
stuff moves up and down, except now you have this really fast viewport. So I'm going to change the focal length here, and I'm changing the cameras. The cameras are about to have a huge update soon um, because we're adding photometrics and we're doing a lot of new stuff to it. But let's do this, 65 mil. That's pretty good. And I'm going to just tweak the height a little bit, like here. This shot obviously has no narrative, but I'm going to grab me. And I'm going to spin myself kind of like I was talking to somebody. Right. And you can see now how different this workflow is, how much faster you're telling. You can tell like what's actually going on uh, and what it's going to look like. So let's add some depth in here, a little bit of mid ground where you at. There you are. OK, this is not a good scene or anything, but it will illustrate pretty well what's going on. So now we're looking through the camera. And we can then go to the Redshift camera and click the actual Alexa camera. And now we want to focus. So to do that, you do the normal thing, focus distance. You click this little arrow, and you click it on me, where you want to focus. But you'll see that nothing has changed. So to turn on the depth of field with Redshift, you click on the tag. And there's a couple things here. And this is going to be really important later, but uh, for now, it's not that important. Uh, we're going to click Enabled. So now the background is blurry. And we change the focus again the same way by going back to the object. So you have to go back and forth. And now you can click on what you want to be in focus. So we can focus on the background. And I'm out of focus. And look how fast this updates. Now I'm focused there. And now I'm focused there. I mean really, really fast. Like, like incredible. Like it's, it's so fun now. Depth of field does not make render slower at all. Um, unfortunately right now, the how out of focus it is, is COC radius. So if I change this to zero, all everything's in focus. If I make it two, it's very, very shallow. Like, does it make sense shallow? And somewhere like 0.8 to, to 1.1, I feel like is pretty realistic for most lenses. I'm going to eventually have to tie this to the actual aperture um, because right now that's a very arbitrary number and I don't like working that way. If you want to make this um, anamorphic, I would go to like, oh no, I would go to like 1.3. Like so it's very shallow. And then change the aspect to 0.5. And now everything is going to bokeh uh, vertically. It's going to be stretched. So this gives you a very convincing anamorphic look, 2x anamorphic look. In my opinion, a, a, a 1.3 anamorphic would be like 0.3, I believe. Something like that. Or maybe it's 0.6. I think it's 0.6. But uh, you can play with it. Uh, here is exposure. And I am going to be reworking all the cameras to work with this exposure setting. Uh, a lot's happening, but you have you do have um, you have your ISO, your shutter time, and your f-stop. I have not uh, calibrated Cine Designer to respect these yet, but we will be doing that in the future. But as you'd expect, if you change this to a four, it gets bright. Go back to an eight. If you made this twenty-five, it makes it darker. So this does work correctly, but the f-stop isn't tied to the actual um, out of focus yet. I'll tie those together soon. Uh, and you can change the white balance and a whole bunch of other things. I'm going to turn it off, actually, for now. Uh, and I actually recommend if you're going to be using Cine Designer Redshift for now, keep it off because I haven't calibrated to the system. I'm still learning um, the ins and outs of how this system works so I can calibrate everything. But So that is a quick overview of Redshift. I'm going to turn off lock. So now I'm looking through this view. And before I wrap this up, I wanted to show one thing because this is like one of the main reasons to use Redshift is that it does volumetric lighting very quickly. And I'm not going to show you the advanced uh, volumetric lighting. Uh, we're going to use like a really basic one. I guess I'll use the, I mean, I want to actually use a sky panel. So this is not accurate necessarily. You probably wouldn't use a sky panel in this case. But uh, I'm going to show you how to do uh, volumetric lighting. And it's really simple and it's really fast. I love it. So we're going to flip this around 180. And I'm going to turn it on, and I'm going to turn off my dome light. So I'm going to just click that. So now it's just this little tiny sky panel. And you'd have to obviously be at a very high ISO for this to actually show up. But uh, let's do like 100. Let's do 500. Let's do 1,000, something like this. OK, so again, really fast to see updates in the viewport over there. I want to go like this, I guess. And so say we want to pretend like there's a little bit of haze or like a lot of haze in this scene. Uh, what we can do here is we can go to Redshift and we're going to add an environment. And this is essentially like hazing the scene. I'm going to make this 0 0.01. We'll cover these settings in, in the future. But uh, we're going to go to our sky panel. And if you go to the controls here, we have something called volume, volume contribution. So as you crank this up, 
it starts to put out a lot of haze. And, and so this essentially tells the light um, how much to contribute into the haze. So it's not physically accurate in that you can have different lights with different amounts of haze in it, but uh, I think that's a, a, that is acceptable. It's, it's a little faster to work that way than have everything beyond the same global haze level. So now we can build scenes like this. Um, let's see, I'm just going to quickly, quickly put this together, kind of kit bash this together. It's not great, but should get the point across. Oh, wow, this came out <laughs> messy, but whatever. Uh, let's make this a little bit bigger here. And then let's fly down into our actual scene. And now we have some very cool volumetric lighting happening. And it happens all pretty much real time, really fast. So sky panel is probably not the most appropriate light for the the Lux output, but we'll, we'll be addressing that soon in the future. And uh, yeah, volumetrics are very, very, very fast here. So we can just add basically haze to any light. It can be a space light, uh, a panel light, it can be a spotlight, whereas in physical, it's only for spotlights, and that's kind of limiting. So let's grab our sky panel up here, and we can make our backlight kind of like sodium vapor-ish, like this. It's very saturated. All right, and then we can change how much haze there is. Make it like super foggy and thick. That's like Blade Runner thick, right? That is, that is some thick haze. And this, there's so much more to cover, but uh, in, at least this video is going to be like, you know, hours long. The last thing you want to do is if you're turning on GI, which this you won't have much of, I would recommend Brute Force and Radiance Point Cloud. Don't change anything else. Just, just use those for now. We'll cover what those mean in the future. And you are, if you're using Redshift and you just want to go play around with it, even if it's just the demo, I believe the demo, all this stuff still works. You now have volumetrics. You can do depth of field, GI, uh, shiny materials. Like, look at the ground. Look at that ground, right? Like, look at this resolving. Like, look at the reflection in the asphalt. It looks amazing. I mean, in my opinion, it looks amazing. And let's look through the actual camera real quick. Is that shot still viable? Eh, it's a weird shot, but uh, I guess I'll just render that really quickly. We render this. Oh, it's probably going to render the BTS shot. Oh, no, it'll, it'll render. Let's see how this goes here. Well, this is a, a 720 frame. It rendered in nine seconds, right? So that's that's ridiculous compared to physical. With all of these effects turned on and the quality it's giving out here, it's really fast. So if you're interested in using this GPU technology that is honestly the future of rendering, CPU rendering is like, I mean, big productions are going to use it, but for like a solo indie artist, like most Cine designers, if you get a Windows laptop, like a uh, Microsoft Surface Book 2 is really good. I'm using that. You can use a Razer Blade, an MSI, an Adele, anything that has an NVIDIA GPU in it, you can do this and it's going to work great. The Mac computers, the only way you can get an Apple computer to do this is if it's a modern one running like High Sierra, and then you need to do Thunderbolt Three, is that what it is? To an eGPU enclosure, and then you're stuck with this like huge case on your computer, and then you can't travel with it. So I really recommend getting a Windows computer if you want to keep continue to progress in the 3D world. But again, um, it is possible with a Mac, and you can get it with a laptop if you want to just get into it. To me, this is the future. This allows really fast rendering. I can do VR renders in 8K, and they're like two minutes of frame versus two hours. I can load these scans in there. I can drop like 50 scans in there, huge scans, very realistic. Put in this in the designer lights. It's all very fast. It's very interactive. I love it. And I've been using this for the past couple months. Everything I've been doing on Instagram is basically this. And um, this is the intro to it. Let me know if you have any questions here or on the forum. There's a lot to learn. You can just search for Redshift stuff on your own. And I'm going to be continuing to develop uh, Cine Designer alongside with Redshift for Cinema 4D. And it's an amazing solution. It is a little bit more expensive. You have to buy Redshift. You have to have all this stuff together. But um, Cinema 4D and Cine Designer, this is where I'm trying to keep like the flagship high-end um, workflows alive. There is going to be something coming out in the future that's a little bit more affordable. And it's not as powerful as far as rendering, but it's a lot of fun too. So we'll, we'll be diving into that maybe by like the end of this year, something like that. So that is our first look at Redshift, really long rambly video. Hopefully it works as a demo and uh, we'll be doing more videos in the future. Until next time, I'll see you guys on the next one.